Okay, thanks for tuning in. Today we have Jamie Douglas for a part two, talking through chronic adaptations to eccentric training, a systematic review. So thanks for tuning in, Jamie. Thanks, Rob. Good to be back. Good to have you, mate. So um, do you just want to take us through um, kind of similar process to last time and just take us a little bit of a review of the review? Yep, sure thing. Um, so yeah, this is our second paper covering the eccentric training literature. Um, as opposed to the last looking at the, the acute responses, which was a narrative review, um, this is a systematic review. So I'll just quickly go through the methods. Um, a little bit of background first. So as per the last podcast, we do know that muscle forces tend to be highest uh, during lengthening or eccentric contractions. Um, and within training, the prescription of load is generally dictated by concentric strength, which therefore tends to insufficiently load um, the eccentric phase. So a growing body of evidence, and a, a pretty strong body of evidence, does indicate that uh, accounting for this eccentric strength can elicit a superior adaptive response um, versus, say, concentric only or traditional resistance training. So uh, with this paper, we wanted to um, systematically retrieve and collect studies that directly compared eccentric training with concentric or traditional resistance training. Um, and to do that, just in terms of the methods, um, we retrieved full journal articles that investigated the long-term effects of eccentric training. Um, for the purposes of this, of this review, we, we defined long-term as greater than or equal to four weeks. Obviously, in the grand scheme, four weeks is not a very long period of time, um, but it's actually quite difficult to, to find training studies that are, that are more than, say, three to four months. So we, we just thought that four weeks would be um, a good minimum threshold to see some of these adaptations. Um, and furthermore, they needed to recruit healthy adult human participants um, within their studies, and papers were excluded if... Um, they didn't meet, meet these criteria, or the training was performed less than twice weekly. Um, the eccentric exercise intensity wasn't quantified. So just, just on this point, um, this is a reason that we didn't really delve into the flywheel or K-box training um, or the Nordic hamstring training, because uh, while often pretty good studies, they don't really quantify the eccentric load that the participants are exposed to. So we, we thought we'd exclude that. Um, and finally, we excluded studies that didn't include a concentric or traditional resistance training control group um, because, again, a few studies that have implemented, uh, implemented some really nice sort of training interventions and study designs, but they've only uh, included a non-training control group. Um, and obviously, any form of resistance training that you're going to do is going to elicit an improvement. So we wanted to see what this... Um, augmented or accentuated eccentric training, the effect it would have relative to um, a typical resistance training program you'd see in practice. And just moving down to the results and discussion. So we found 40 studies that met these criteria, um, which gave us 1,150 participants. Um, a bit of a bias towards males, um, unfortunately representative um, of sports science as a whole. Um, the mean age being 24 years, um, with the majority of investigations recruiting untrained participants. So 32 out of 40 of the studies recruited untrained, which is an important limitation, um, but again, does tend to reflect um, sports science research as a whole. And finally, uh, the average duration or training intervention duration was just under 10 weeks with a frequency of three sessions per week. Um, single joint movements were primarily investigated, as well as isokinetic modalities. Um, and this is a bit of a limitation in terms of um, inferring, I guess, practical applications to, to how we train and practice with athletes. But again, it does, does give a, a level of control and confidence in, in terms of what we know um, the participants are being exposed to. Um, it gives us confidence in, um, I guess, understanding um, the adaptive response um, or how accurate or representative of the adaptive response is. So there were two main arms or, or branches that we looked at, the first being uh, muscle mechanical function. So I'll just come down and we'll look at our key variables. 
So in terms of muscle mechanical function, we looked at muscle strength, muscle power and stretch shortening cycle performance, uh, and finally contractile rate of force development. The second main branch looked at muscle tendon unit morphology and architecture. And the first main variable was, was looking at muscle cross-sectional area, or hypertrophy, um, as well as some architectural changes. Um, we then looked at muscle fibre size and composition, so effectively just um, the fibre type specific response. And finally, we looked at tendon cross-sectional area, and, as well as qualitative changes to tendon. So we'll just come over to some slides that summarise the literature. So in terms of muscle mechanical function, by and large, the, the bulk of the studies found um, a greater increase in total strength with eccentric training versus traditional resistance training, um, bearing in mind that there is a mode specificity. So eccentric uh, strength training improves eccentric strength to a greater extent than concentric and vice versa. So if concentric strength is important, which is the case for most sports really, um, you do still need to include this, this concentric phase. Um, the large increase in eccentric strength that's typically observed with long-term eccentric training um, is probably related to disinhibition. So I touched on this idea that eccentric strength is largely constrained or inhibited at the level of the spinal cord um, in our last chat. So effectively with this training, um, we do believe that we're taking the handbrake off. So this figure on the right over here is a nice representation. So we see this increase in eccentric strength and this large increase in neuromuscular activation within the eccentric phase. Uh, in terms of jumping power or general low, lower body power, we see an increase to a greater extent versus traditional resistance training, um, probably related to these changes in strength or improvements in strength, uh, as well as some morphological adaptations, which we'll touch on. Um, and we also see a greater increase in leg spring stiffness versus concentric training, as well as stretch shortening cycle performance um, versus traditional resistance training. So effectively, they just they bounce better. Um, they can utilize that elastic energy. So at the bottom right, we have um, a really nice study by Lou et al, who included a bunch of different uh, practical outcome measures um, following their eccentric training intervention. So basically, PLP refers to uh, fast eccentric training. Um, PLP low refers to slow eccentric training. And traditional is just your traditional resistance training group. Um, and this is looking at um, stretch shortening cycle efficiency, or the rate ratio of counter movement jump um, to squat jump performance, or the ability to utilize um, elastic energy. So with fast eccentric training, they found an approximately 11% increase with slow, around about 4%, um, and with traditional resistance training, around about 2%. Um, so some really in interesting effects um, with this heavy and fast eccentric intervention. Okay, and moving on to muscle morphology, we do see a greater increase in muscle cross-sectional area versus concentric training, um, but it probably is similar to traditional resistance training. Um, however, of interest, um, it does appear that the distribution of this hypertrophy does differ depending on contraction type. So we do see a greater increase in distal hypertrophy with eccentric training. So we can see over here that um, the net cross-sectional area increase is greater versus, say, concentric. Um, but the majority of the hypertrophy is, is occurring in the distal muscle belly, which is quite interesting because we also see an increase in fascicle length as we can see down here, versus concentric training, which is thought to reflect um, an increase in sarcomeres in series, um, which does, we believe, have important implications for the maximal shortening velocity of muscle, um, and therefore muscle power. Um, and this would also induce a rightward shift of the length tension curve, meaning that uh, longer or, or higher muscle forces can be produced at longer muscle lengths, um, which would have um, implications for the reduction of injury, particularly um, hamstring strain injuries, and that's why we see 
um, a pretty strong body of evidence now supporting the use of Nordic hamstring training and re reducing hamstring injuries. Uh, in terms of the fibre type specific response, we do see a greater increase, um, greater than or equal to traditional resistance training in terms of type 2 fibre area, so type 2 fibre hypertrophy. Um, and what's really interesting is there was a study that found with fast eccentric contractions uh, an increase in 2x composition. Um, and this is interesting because there's no other training study out there that's demonstrated this, the shift towards the, the fastest myosin um, heavy chain type. So irrespective of the training type that you do, whether it be power, strength or endurance, there tends to be a shift from 2x to 2a or a more um, fatigue resistance phenotype. Um, and the only other way that we've seen um, to induce this reverse shift is with detraining. So really interesting effect here. Again, it's only a single study. Um, however, it's not really been well repli replicated since. No one's really tried to replicate it. Um, and we also see um, an increase in 2x mRNA upregulation following heavy eccentric training. Um, but either way, um, we do see a general shift towards a faster phenotype due to an increase in the relative area of um, type 2 fibers, so a specific 2A hypertrophy, um, as well as the increase in sarcomeres in series. Okay, moving on to tendon morphology and function, we see a greater increase in tendon cross-sectional area versus concentric training. Um, and it's actually quite difficult to attain quantitative changes in tendon tissue with other training modes. So this could be an important finding. Um, we also see an increase in tendon stiffness to a greater extent than concentric training. Um, it is possible that it could just be the magnitude of load imposed versus um, a contraction, um, contraction type mediation of this effect. So on the left here, this is a comparison of standard eccentric versus heavy eccentric, so accounting for eccentric strength um, in terms of um, the shift and the force elongation and stress strain curves. Um, so we see a greater leftward shift with heavy eccentric loads, which basically just reflects an increase in tendon stiffness. So the fun stuff, um, the application to sprint performance, we do see an improvement in 20 to 40 meter times with eccentric training but um, it's only superior to traditional resistant training if both fast eccentric and concentric phases are included. Um, and just a brief aside, we know that at least elite sprinters apply more force in less time during ground contact to attain a higher max velocity. Um, and this is especially apparent in the first half or the eccentric phase of ground contact. So on the right, we have a figure from the Clark and Wayne study from 2014. Um, so they looked at some really talented sprinters. I think they had a few sub-10, 100-meter guys in here. And effectively, they, they, they saw a really strong correlation um, between the vertical force applied in the first half of ground contact and the max attained top speed, um, so this first half being the eccentric phase, with virtually no relationship during the second half um, and this can be seen here in this full spike upon ground contact. So we do think that eccentric qualities will be related to leg spring stiffness, so being able to strike the ground, um, and then contact time, and the magnitude of potentiation of concentric power output uh, within the stretch shortening cycle. Um, and just a brief note on detraining from eccentric training. Um, the questions floating around as to whether the time frame for detraining from eccentric training differs from say concentric or traditional, um, and the data would indicate that most likely yes it does. Um, so a study that just came out this year that I wasn't able to include in my review um, did show a bit of maintenance and possibly even an increase of strength, strength endurance and size adaptations with eccentric training versus other modalities after six weeks of detraining. So over on the right we have this figure here and we see this improvement in relative 1RM with eccentric training, and then a better maintenance, and possibly even another increase relative to baseline, and that's following six weeks of no training at all. And in that same vein, we do see an extended residual or lag effect with eccentric training. So power can peak eight weeks after the cessation of training with no maintenance load within that time. 
So in this study by Long et al, we see maximum power plotted against uh, peddling rates um, or optimal cadence effectively. And we see at the bottom here, we have the pre-training curve, the triangles in the middle being one week post, and then eight weeks post. And again, remember there's, there's no maintenance load at all within this eight weeks. We see a further increase. Um, and off the top of my head, I think this was a statistically significant increase as well, as well as a rightward shift of this, of this curve. Um, so some really interesting effects there in terms of um, this residual. Okay, so hopefully to, to tie all this together, um, with the increase in eccentric muscle mechanical function, so strength, power, and stiffness, um, and the increase in, or, or the shift towards the faster muscle phenotype, so um, that would be the increase in type 2 fiber area, the proportion of the muscle taken up by type 2 fibers, and the increase in sarcomeres and series, in combination with a stiffer muscle tendon unit um, to, to rapidly transfer this force, we do believe we'd see a rightward shift of the force velocity curve. So that would look something like this, the blue line at the bottom being pre-training, at the top we see post-training, um, and I have to give credit to my supervisor Angus Ross for this slide, um, but basically we think that this, this would reflect um, a shift towards a velocity dominant profile. Um, purely hypothetical, um, but it would make sense given the underlying adaptations that we are seeing. Um, and this is really interesting because we know that having a velocity dominant profile is a really key, um, key measure of performance in, in sprinting. Um, and it's really easy to improve someone's force producing capabilities. Any SNC can get somebody stronger, um, but getting someone faster or improving their velocity capabilities is a different animal. Um, and is much more challenging to achieve in practice. So just some, some practical thoughts to wrap up really. Um, if you work in a speed or power sport, um, you should seriously consider the implementation of eccentric training. Um, and there are plenty of op options floating around that don't require expensive equipment. Um, so just to use a Kiwi term, it can be a little bit niggly implementing some of these methods, but if you're creative, it's, it's not too challenging to do. Um, secondly, heavy eccentric loads and fast tempos do seem to maximize these adaptations um, and given the, the unique force velocity profile during eccentric contractions um, that we discussed in the last chat, um, the two can be combined. So with the heaviest or, or the, the greatest tension generated at the fastest contraction velocity. Um, we are yet to dis discern best practice in terms of load prescription or periodization. So I wasn't really able to give any concrete recommendations within the review because there's such a range of different protocols used. Um, it really is early days in terms of um, finding out um, best practice in this area. Um, but we do know that an extended residual training effect could mean um, an extended taper um, to really peak speed and power expression. Um, so hopefully in the next year or so, some research that we'll be doing here um, we'll answer some of these questions. So basically, watch this space. And that's pretty much Fantastic. it. Fantastic. Fantastic, mate. Can you still hear me? Yep, yep. Perfect. Um, where can people get in, get in touch with you first? Uh, you're on Twitter again? Yep, yep. So Jamie Douglas NZ on Twitter. Perfect. And where can people get the paper? So this one, as per the last, is on Sports Med. Um, and I'm also on ResearchGate as well, where they can contact me and I can send it through. Fantastic. That's great. It's it's great to not speak at all and just listen and be interested. <laughs> so that's fantastic. <laughs> good to hear. Thank you, mate. Really appreciate that. And I'll, Always, um, mate. Good to be here. Yeah. Cool. And I'll chat soon. Cheers, mate. Thanks, mate.